Okay. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Alexandros Tsadiras. Uh, I'm welcoming you to today's lecture. We are happy to have us here with us, the doctor, I will try to pronounce it correctly, Zolt, okay? A very good friend from Hungary, who will be delivering a lecture on the legal sources and nature of the parliamentary procedure. Um, uh, Zolt um, is an academic. His, his, his field of specialization is parliamentary law. And he will, in the course of the lecture, provide us with a number of insights uh, as regards the legal sources and the nature of parliamentary, parliamentary procedure in Hungary, if I'm correct. No, no, in, in various countries. In various countries, okay, that's even better. Uh, the lecture will last for uh, approximately 40 minutes, and then we are going to have a two-minute Q&A, questions and answers session. Um, uh, so feel free to pose any questions in the course of the lecture. Now, I think with, without further ado, um, I give the, the floor to Zolt, who will enlighten us on the parliamentary procedures and any related issues. Jolt, dear friend, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alexandros, for this kind uh, introduction. Let me start with uh, my first slide stating that the house rules do matter. We shouldn't uh, underestimate house rules. Of course, normally we look at constitutions, we look at parliamentary legislation, and we tend to forget uh, the importance of parliamentary internal procedural rules. Somebody even would find that boring to look at parliamentary procedure, meaning who can speak, how long, what is the uh, subsequent steps, what uh, comes after, what. But I uh, think my statement is that house rules matter. Uh, procedures heavily influence policy outcomes. The institutional and procedural settings in the background uh, are very influential uh, on the policy outcomes also. If uh, government is unable to push legislation through parliament, it, uh, the government doesn't have the usual and useful channels to do that this would uh, affect heavily the government's policy. And now let me highlight another aspect, the question of majority rules and minority rights. Of course, the history is always written by the winners, as we all know. Uh, the rules are always written by the majority, by the political majorities, who are also players in the political game. But in my view, the minority rights should always be respected uh, because uh, democracy principles, democratic principles cannot be played uh, out uh, one against the other. So uh, nevertheless, the majority has the right to decide, to determine the procedures, that's correct, but in a democracy, the minority should be heard and should be respected. In a very early phase of the history, of the British Parliament, it was already obvious that Parliament's houses had the right to determine their own proceedings. And in the later course of the history, this was the case uh, also in other countries later on, that the Parliament slowly gained right to determine its own internal procedure, proceedings. This was the most ancient rights of Parliaments. Nobody else outside Parliament could tell how a Parliament should organize its work. This was a crucial part of parliamentary autonomy. What do I mean by own proceedings? The organization of the Parliament's internal structure, the relation between committees and plenary, for example, the structure of uh, the parliamentary work, the procedures, the sequence of the different steps, the allocation of time, very important because time is short in parliament always. Time, parliamentary time is very precious and there is constantly a fight 
for uh, available time. And discipline measures are also should uh, also also should stay in the hand of uh, of the parliament. I mean, only parliament can punish breaches against parliamentary rules. No other external forum should be uh, given this competence. So the parliament should have disciplinary measures. This is also part of. Uh, historically developed parliamentary autonomy. Let's step to the next slide. Uh, the sources of parliamentary law will be highlighted in this presentation from the United Kingdom, the United States, France and Germany. And after that, I will uh, give you some basic things on the legal nature of parliamentary rules of procedure. What are they in the legal system? Are they laws? Are they internal rules? Are there customary rules? This vary, of course, uh, country by country. So this is why uh, I would uh, like to ask and answer this question. And then, uh, as a final step, I will uh, look around in the judicial control over the House rules. Uh, is it possible to uh, let the judiciary decide uh, in breaches of parliamentary uh, procedures, or is this, or, or or it goes against the parliamentary autonomy, because previously I stated that it does. Okay, in England, the so-called exclusive cognizance of parliament uh, was a very ancient principle. It means. The, the sole authority within competence to examine matters which fall within its four walls. So the exclusive cognizance uh, of, uh, of, of the Westminster system means that Parliament is entitled to determine its own procedures. Let me mention an important person, Erskine May, who lived in the 19th century. He was starting his career as a, as a little Clark in Parliament, and he finished its career as the uh, top uh, civil servant of the House of Commons. And his book, which he compiled, the three ties on the law, privileges, proceedings, and usage of Parliament from 1844, is an authoritative source on parliamentary procedure still today. Uh, maybe I mentioned in other lectures that there is not a codified set of rules of procedure in the British Parliament. The most important rule of the uh, British parliamentary functioning is Erskine May's book, which is a very uh, thick book of 1,000 pages. And let me just mention that uh, it is published in each uh, fourth or fifth year newly. It's uh, constantly uh, renewed, refreshed by m more recent practice. Of course, not by him, because he is already dead, but uh, by present uh, uh, clerks of parliament. And this was uh, only available in print editions until 2019. And only 2019, it was put online. So it was very interesting for me to experience that uh, it was not uh, possible to learn parliamentary procedures, because uh, there were no legal sources which are freely available. The customary rules were compiled in a book which costed about four to 500 British pounds, which is extremely expensive. But two years ago, as I mentioned, you can see the link here on the slide. It was put online, erskinemay.parliament.uk. You can uh, now have free access to this important book, which is mostly boring for externals, but interesting who like these parliamentary procedures. Um, what is said, I have a quotation here. The parliament's autonomy, the exclusive cognizance, means the right to be the soul of the lawfulness of parliament's own proceedings and to settle or depart from their own codes of procedure. It means that Parliament can not only determine, but also deviate from its uh, rules. 
it also belongs to its autonomy. Uh, what sources are there? Uh, the custom and practice uh, set out in Erskine May, the standing orders, there's a short set of uh, orders which are adopted for a long run, which can be called as rules of procedure, but they are not a, a, a comprehensive set of rules of procedure. It, it's, it's rather a compilation of, of scattered uh, rules, and the speaker's rulings are also very important. Uh, since 1678, there are standing rule, standing orders adopted by the House of Commons. These were only uh, one or two for a very long time. In the 19th century, seven, as I said, 1810, as, as you see, I mean. And the number was constantly raising in 2003, uh, the UK Parliament had 163 uh, uh, standing orders. So besides the customary rules, there are also uh, standing orders in a growing number. Maybe, who knows, uh, the Brits will also adopt a comprehensive set of uh, standing orders. We will see what the future brings, maybe they will also adopt their written constitution, their codified constitution. Let me give you an example in the next point. There is a three readings procedure in lawmaking based on customary rules. There is neither a standing order nor a rules of procedure describing this sequence. There is no mentioning of the third reading in the standing orders. Everything is uh, based on customs uh, written in uh, uh, Erskine May. In the next point, let me uh, mention just the House of Lords very shortly, which is a self-regulating cham chamber with very few rules. The Lord Speaker is an absolutely passive person sitting in the middle. He doesn't give the floor, or she, because now there is a female speaker there, she, she wouldn't give the floor to the lords. The lords give the floor to each other. It's very interesting to witness uh, that uh, procedure because a lord shouldn't be anybody, so they regulate themselves. And there is not a closure of debate since 1927, so they close their own debates and they hand over the word to each other. They are self-regulating. Um, somebody would ask the question, how is that possible to reform procedures in these circumstances? Those are not written rules, how to change them? Well, uh, actually it's not uh, hard to change the practice. You just do something differently the next day as you did earlier. Besides traditions, there are very many novelties in the British parliamentary uh, system. Let me mention that in 1979, a completely new committee system was brought to life, a permanent control committee system. There was a big house reform 2001, or the Bad Batch Business Committee was established in 2010, which allocates time for backbench MPs, both from the opposition and from the government. So what I mean here is that uh, besides not having a comprehensive set of parliamentary rules, reforms and changes are nevertheless possible. Uh, in the USA, the most important source of parliamentary procedures is the work of Thomas Jefferson, who was president of the Senate. Jefferson's manual is still used by speakers of Senate and House of Representatives. Uh, in the US Constitution, there is also a source of exclusive cognizance. Each house may determine the rules of its proceedings, punish its members for disorderly behaviors. But let me clarify here something. Parliamentary law, this um, word, this term, doesn't refer to parliamentary procedure in the United States because that is congressional procedure. They always use the term Congress and not Parliament in the US context. So what do they mean by parliamentary law? Parliamentary law is nothing else than set of rules that a public or private group uses to conduct meetings. 
Okay, so uh, uh, parliamentary law is the basis of the functioning of a church board, for example, or a civil organization, an association, for example, of stamp collectors or fishermen. If they come together for the yearly assembly, there are parliamentary law uh, rules which govern their meetings. Uh, as simple as it is to listen to each other, let's just deal with one point of agenda at once and so on. This is parliamentary law which is taught and practiced uh, everywhere in the US society. Uh, and part of it is, of course, congressional uh, procedure. Now in France, um, uh, we witnessed constant changes in the constitutional system. Now they have a solid uh, system since 1958, of course, but uh, the French Revolution uh, started uh, very many changes which were uh, constantly changing until the middle of the 20th century, actually. Prime Minister Poincaré said that a good set of house rules is more important than a constitution in order to amend the constitution. So he really understood the importance of parliamentary procedure. He said, give me a good uh, rules of procedure and I will be able to control the constitution. So he almost said that parliamentary rules of procedure are almost as important as the constitution uh, itself. The influence of Jeremy Bentham's work, Essay on Political Tactics, had also an influence on the French system. Um, as I said, there, there were constant changes. Let me give you one example. At the beginning of the revolution, they began with three readings. Then it was diminished to two readings, the lawmaking. And 1814, only one reading was there. And single committee session and single plenary reading was part of the procedure only. Uh, and before the, uh, uh, the Napoleonic reforms, they were very suspicious with committees. The French Revolution didn't like the committees. Uh, the committee work has no trust against plenary. Uh, until 1833, the selection of MPs to committees were done by lottery. They didn't like that people, members of the committee, discuss behind closed doors and the others cannot see what's going on there. And in the French system, there was even governmental influence. Uh, government decrees regulated parliament's work, which is clearly uh, against uh, the principles which I mentioned in the British and American system. OK, what about Germany? the last country I present to you. In Germany, there were no traditions in history because Germany was uh, not a unified country. Um, there were very long debates uh, on the rules and there was no parliamentary sovereignty. Uh, the three reading procedure originating from England was take over, uh, taken over since 1848 in some German territories. Uh, single committee and plenary phases on the federal level. Uh, I mean, single uh, reading in committee and in plenary and no more. But then the three readings on the plenary were taken back. So there was also some changes uh, in history uh, of Germany. I'm not uh, telling about any kinds of rules. I'm focusing on lawmaking procedure now. Of course, uh, there was a big shock when the Nazis uh, had the power. There was an attack uh, by them against parliamentarism. Uh, in March 1933, there was the very controversial decision of those MPs who did not excuse themselves before uh, should be seen as being present. This was the ill-famed enabling acts adoption. Some opposition members were arrested by the police, so they couldn't make an excuse, and they were counted as being present. 
during counting of the votes. So this is a clear misuse uh, of parliamentary procedure and parliamentary rules. In the current German constitution from 1949, uh, the sentence is there. The parliament provides itself with rules of procedure. And I can show you uh, another example uh, for, from Germany. Uh, the Nazis were not yet in majority, but uh, uh, the leader of the house, the speaker, was from the Nazi party. It happened in 12th of September 1932. You can see a photo on this ill-famed moment of German history. Uh, the Reichstag, as you can read, passed a motion of no confidence against the Franz von Papen cabinet, although the Prime Minister Papen called the vote illegal because he was entitled to the floor and had already pegged the decree on the Speaker's desk about dissolving Parliament. So the Prime Minister Papen already had in his, in his hand the document signed by the President to dissolve Parliament and he put it on the Speaker's desk. But the Speaker intentionally didn't notice that because in the same time the opposition launched a motion of no confidence against his government. So there were two concurring motions before the House, one motion brought by the Prime Minister and one motion brought by the opposition. It was clearly uh, established by practice which had uh, to prevail but uh, as you see on the picture, the speaker in the upper right corner turned his head to a different direction as if he would not notice the prime minister's document being put on his desk. And he gave the floor to the opposition. Why? Because for him, it was politically more beneficial if the uh, parliament withdraw the confidence from the government instead of simply dissolving itself. So that was a political game. Uh, okay, I just wanted to describe different countries' approach to parliamentary procedures in the first part. And now in the second part, I would like to give some uh, solutions from different countries on the legal nature of house rules. What can be uh, the legal nature of these house rules? What uh, are their role in the hierarchy of norms? Of course, the highest rank is the constitution in a legal order. In the constitution, we find uh, very generally in many, many countries, some provisions, at least on the parliamentary autonomy. At least with one sentence, it's mentioned that parliament has the right to create its own procedures. I showed you the uh, examples for these four countries. Uh, to, to make one step below uh, the laws, the statutes of parliament uh, are below the constitution. We see that uh, the Austrian model uh, taken over by other countries uh, is uh, as follows. In Austria, the Czech Republic and Slovakia, the parliamentary rules of procedure are on the statute level. Parliament adopts them as a statute, as a law made by parliament, its own internal procedures. Uh, there is another pro pro possibility that rules of procedure are not statutes. They are simply parliamentary decrees, which means internal decisions of the parliament. This is the case of Germany and Hungary. So these are not on the statute level. Those are internal rules, which means that they are not in the hierarchy of norms at all. And in some countries, uh, pre precedents play important role. For example, the UK and the USA. In case of laws, no parliamentary autonomy can be observed because uh, also other organs contribute uh, to the lawmaking. In Hungary and in many, many countries, the head of state, the president, has to sign uh, laws uh, which, uh, when, they, uh, uh, when they put them uh, into, the, into effect. 
Okay, so Parliament uh, cannot uh, uh, adopt them alone. This is why I think uh, that uh, the parliamentary autonomy is a little bit limited if uh, uh, the parliamentary rules are put in statutes, because also external organs has a, have a say in that. On the contrary, those are very stable and uh, they can treat also external relations. In a law, you can write obligations of citizens, while in internal parliamentary uh, rules of procedure, you cannot write that a, a, a simple citizen has to appear before a parliamentary committee of inquiry, for example. In a statute, you can write that. And another uh, issue, from internal rules, you can deviate, as I said, uh, in the UK Parliament, you can always deviate uh, from your own decisions if it's an internal uh, decision, but you cannot deviate from a statute. Statutes of Parliament, laws of Parliament should be uh, followed, should be respected. It's not possible to agree that uh, today we will do not follow the, the rules which are set in the Parliamentary Act of Procedure. So there are uh, differences between these solutions. Um, the other question is the timeline. Internal rules can be temporary, but statutes are not temporary. Statutes are meant to eternity. If, if a parliament uh, adopts a statute, this is meant for, for the undefined uh, future. Um, and they cannot respect the discontinuity principle of the uh, parliamentary terms. And uh, let's have a look at uh, the required majority. I have just really some examples here. In Italy, an absolute majority, the majority of all MPs is required to adopt uh, parliamentary rules. Uh, while in Hungary, two thirds of the MPs present, so the qualified majority of those in the room are required. But uh, these are examples, these are exceptions. In the majority of the countries, a simple majority uh, in Germany or the UK, a simple majority can adopt and change parliamentary rules. All right, my last point is about a judicial control over house rules. Uh, the issue here is whether or not the judiciary should be given a competence to judge over breaches of parliamentary procedure. Because the parliamentary autonomy principle says that it should be left on parliament to take action if uh, rules are not respected. The big problem is that sometimes the parliamentary majority and sometimes even the speaker doesn't respect parliamentary rules. So it's not uh, a solution to go there to him and argue against those breaches. Uh, on the other hand, you can entitle, uh, empower an external forum to have a say in disputes when uh, rules were, uh, were not respected on the cost of uh, breaching the parliamentary autonomy, because then parliament is not autonomous anymore. The internal and external review is different from this point of view. Uh, by internal review, the internal autonomy is more important. In case of external judicial review, the democracy and the checks and balances is more important and, and the parliamentary autonomy is less important. You have to always balance uh, as a creator of constitutional rule, which you put first. Uh, in Germany, there is a very successful procedure since uh, 1949, since the current constitution, the so-called Organstreitverfahren, which is the uh, dispute procedure between constitutional bodies. It's possible in Germany to sue uh, each other. The government can sue the parliament, parliamentary minority can sue the majority. They can appear as parties 
in front of the constitutional court and they can uh, bring their uh, conflicts to the constitutional courts. So uh, they created a legal way, uh, a legal forum for um, conflicts. Um, for example, if a, an MP is not given the floor, uh, even if the rules of procedure uh, uh, makes this possibility, then he can turn to the constitutional court. I have this quotation from the, but I will, would not read it out now, from the German constitution. Uh, if you are interested, you can look for it, Article 93, Paragraph 1, Section 1, which uh, describes this, uh, uh, this uh, procedure I explained. Uh, in France, there is an ex ante check by the constitutional court, usually. Um, this is it, so it's not a sufficient solution for uh, uh, procedural uh, issues. In the UK, USA and Netherlands, uh, the Finnish legislation is not disputed at all. So, uh, also in France, this is the case. Uh, they all only check uh, before uh, the, the, the legislation. And if uh, the legislation is a product of a wrong procedure, you cannot do anything. And those in the same in the USA, UK and the Netherlands, the Finnish legislation cannot be challenged. Okay? If uh, during a legislative procedure, one MP couldn't have the right to file an amendment, for example, then this can lead in Hungary to, uh, to a strike down of the law by the Constitutional Court. When a serious breach uh, of the procedure happens, that could lead to a wrong product. Wrong procedure leads to a wrong product, but not in those three countries which I mentioned. The Finnish legislation is closed and it's not disputed. Um, I'm not telling that Hungary gives a good uh, example to settling uh, arguments on the breaches of parliamentary procedure, but at least in this only one case, there is a chance to correct uh, those mistakes, but only in case of lawmaking. If somebody is, for example, who wants to ask a question from a minister, but the speaker doesn't give the opportunity, and that is not connected with legislation, and that is not a product which could be brought to the Constitutional Court, uh, he cannot do anything. The Constitutional Court has not a general competence to settle issues between constitutional bodies as the German has. It only has the normative control. Let me tell you about some uh, new developments uh, on my last three slides. In Ireland, there was a case uh, in front of the, the Supreme Court, the Kerins and McGuinness. Angela Kerins, um, a lady who was a leader of a, of a government company, was invited uh, to the Public Accounts Committee of the Irish Parliament. And she was uh, literally shocked after a hearing. The MPs put so many questions and so tough questions that she was very embarrassed not being able to answer. These were new questions. She was not prepared for that. She was really shocked. She was going to hospital. She almost attempted to commit suicide. And she went to the Supreme Court and uh, filed against the parliament, saying that they uh, breached my rights. Uh, and interestingly, the Supreme Court stated that uh, the Public Accounts Committee and the MPs were acting ultra vires, which means they didn't uh, respect their own competences. So in this case, uh, Angela Kerins won the case and uh, it was uh, very new. It happened a couple of years ago. Nobody expected, literally, that uh, the Supreme Court, as the third branch, would intervene and uh, say that uh, there is a breach of procedure 
actually not of procedure, the breach of good behavior on the side of the MPs and the, and the committee. All right, and in case of South Africa, there was a series of decisions of the Constitutional Court. Uh, I mention here a very good article by Stephen Gardbaum on that. Uh, and he concludes that special problems call for special remedies. Also in case of the Republic of South Africa, the Constitutional Court intervened and uh, from 2002 up to 2017, slowly reached the control position over parliamentary procedures. I wouldn't go into the details now, but uh, it was really the tendency Parallelly, as the system of South Africa got more and more authoritarian, I mean the Zuma regime now, in these race, in these years, also the Constitutional Court uh, stepped uh, and um, gave himself, gave itself the right to control and judge over parliamentary procedures, not respecting parliamentary autonomy anymore. Okay, so also in case of South Africa, we see that parliamentary autonomy is less important than the good functioning of democracy, separation of powers, and the rule of law. And also in the United, European Court of Human Rights case law, the Strasbourg case law has uh, very interesting uh, examples. For example, in the Hearst against the United Kingdom, it was a case when the court looked into uh, the parliamentary debate on the questioned legislation as a, as a kind of evidence. These were, uh, the court was investigating into a statute and as an evidence, they looked at the parliamentary diary, the parliamentary report, who said what and what arguments uh, could be heard. And the court said there is no evidence that parliament has ever sought to weigh the competing interests or assess the proportionality of a blanket ban on the right of a convicted prisoner to vote. The case was about the prisoner's right to vote. And the Strasbourg court used the argument that parliament didn't take care of this issue seriously. They just uh, very quickly uh, made a decision. And this was one reason why uh, the UK was condemned in this issue. And there was a dissenting uh, opinions, uh, as you see in my second paragraph, Wildbauer, Costa, Lorenzen, Covier and Lebens. Six judges had dissenting uh, opinions stating it's not for the court to prescribe the way in which national legislators, legislatures carry out their legislative functions. But this was the minority opinion in the court. In the United Kingdom uh, and Sweden, in the lack of a constitutional court, the general courts observe usually parliamentary activities. Uh, and about Hungary, to finish my presentation, I would like to say that we don't have a forum to breaches of procedural rules. Only the normative control of the Constitutional Court is there. Uh, I mentioned a decision from 2003 that uh, the Constitutional Court stated that Parliament omitted to regulate the uh, right of committees of inquiry to raise evidence. Citizens which are invited to parliamentary committees don't have the obligation because there is no statutory uh, basis of that. And the Constitutional Court said the parliament should create that statutory basis. Otherwise, it's only based on cooperation of the two parties. And as a reaction, in Hungary in 2012, the obligatory minority initiative was deleted from the toolbox of the opposition. Uh, it was not a nice, uh, not a polite solution. Instead of creating the statutory basis, they actually uh, removed that tool from the opposition's toolbox. Now, as a conclusion, I would say that uh, the parliamentary rules of procedure matter very much. We saw some historical examples for that. And we saw how important is it that parliament is 
left alone to decide on that. Uh, but uh, not only rules are important, also a common understanding and acceptance of those rules is, is, uh, is, is crucial. Uh, the rules uh, are not important if they are not respected. So they have to be there and they have to be followed also. And in democracy, uh, parliament can only go hand in hand with democracy if there are rules based on common acceptance. And finally, I put a question here. We witness that uh, international forums are uh, more and more going into investigating parliamentary procedures. I just gave you a very brief uh, example from the European Court of Human Rights. For this uh, time and up to the 20th century, uh, everybody thought that parliamentary procedures are matters of uh, national parliaments only. But now we see that there are higher forums, the European Union or the European Court of Human Rights uh, intervene uh, in these matters. I ask whether or not there will be a use commune parliamentiensis, whether or not it will uh, be in the future some kind of um, world parliamentary rules or of course there is not a world constitutional court so far uh, but uh, maybe it would be reasonable to uh, adopt in the framework of the united nations some principles uh, what to do and what not to do which should be respected by all national parliaments. This has not happened yet, but this is possible uh, in the future. With this, I stop here and say thank you for your kind attention. Uh, if you have questions, you can ask. This uh, lecture was really not uh, about the fine details. I wanted to present some problems and ask some questions. So I leave it open for further thinking. Uh, and now I see here the question and I read it out so that uh, everybody can see and hear it. And also I can understand it. In case the procedure occurs both from written rules of procedure and from uh, the procedure occurs both from written rules of procedure and from unwritten precedent. If the same issue is converted in both forms, but in a different way, uh, uh, for example, right to question from MP or not in a certain circumstance. If the letter the president is always used, could the speaker of the house decide on the rules of procedure instead of the precedent, for example, reject demand of question on a certain occurrence. Hmm. So the question is about the collision, as I understand, the collision between um, the precedent, the custom, and the written rule. and uh, what happens, how the speaker would decide. Well, this uh, uh, question very much depends on which country we are in. Uh, because uh, the countries differ in this respect. For example, in Hungary, precedents don't play a role uh, in, in our uh, parliamentary custom. Even if there are possibilities of defining some precedents, uh, they are only, only done by scholars and they don't uh, play a, a role in the parliamentary procedure. They always focus on written rules when establishing uh, the, the decision. So in Hungary, parliamentary procedure is based on the rules of procedure uh, in their written form. Now, what about uh, the United Kingdom in this respect? In the UK, 
it's theoretically possible that the standing orders say something and uh, the practical rules say a uh, different thing, but uh, I, to tell you the truth, never witnessed this problem. Uh, what the solution would be in England is that the speaker's ruling is unquestionable. The speaker, like the, the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church, always decides uh, well. So the speaker's ruling have to be followed and the speaker's ruling couldn't be questioned. I can imagine that in some cases the speaker would follow the precedents and in other cases the speaker would follow the written rules uh, in his or her rulings. So uh, I cannot give a general uh, answer to this problem, to this uh, theoretical problem. Uh, it depends on the jurisdiction uh, of, uh, of the certain um, country. This is, this is what I can now uh, read out from the question and, and give as a first impression uh, to that from my experience. I hope I could, if not properly answer, but uh, give something. Okay, this issue recently occurred in Greece where the Speaker of the House declined the demand of question from the head of the opposition even the president said he could. Thank you very much. This is very interesting. Um, I would be very interested to uh, learn this issue, this uh, thing, if there is any English resource of that occurrence, uh, of that case, uh, I would appreciate it. Okay, you have my email here on the last slide. Happy to uh, follow up on that issue. I could uh, also put in my, uh, in my uh, further research that case, but I definitely need more, in form, more uh, information to, to understand the issue properly, which happened in, in Greece. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you, thank everyone for attending this lecture. I would like to thank uh, my friend uh, Zolt for giving some part of his precious time for um, uh, in order to enlighten us on all of these issues. I have to say that I was overwhelmed in the course of the lecture by the wealth of the insights and his findings, and I hope that we will soon have him with us, uh, we will be given the opportunity to listen to any of the new findings deriving from his research. That's the end of the event for today. Thank you very much for being with us. And I uh, hope we will see you soon in one of the forthcoming events that we are currently organizing um, in the course of this uh, broader postgraduate degree that is currently offered by the Open Universe of Cyprus. Thank you very much, Zolt. Hope to see you again. Thank you, everybody. Take care. We wish you a very happy and relaxing evening. Take care.